hello and welcome everyone. Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all and uh, thank you all for being with us. My name is Roger Nelson and I'm a curator at National Gallery Singapore and it's my pleasure to introduce today's lecture, uh, which is um, the third in a series of lectures called Living Pictures Photography in Southeast Asia. These lectures anticipate a major exhibition with the same title, which will open at National Gallery Singapore in November of this year. It's actually uh, something new for us to organize lectures so far in advance um, of the exhibition. And what we're doing with this is really um, uh, foregrounding the innovative and exciting research that's being done uh, in the field today. So the discussions that we'll be having in today's lecture um, really will help us to build and shape our vocabulary um, as we work towards the exhibition opening later this year. So let me quickly run through the format of today's lecture. Um, first, uh, Jacqueline Huang Nguyen will be giving a, a talk of around 45 minutes, um, followed immediately by a prepared response from Zoe Butt for about 10 to 15 minutes. After that, there'll be time for a live discussion with questions. You are free to type your questions or comments anytime uh, into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, you won't need to speak to ask your question, but rather simply to type it in there. And then when we get to the discussion part of the session, uh, I'll field those questions for the speakers today. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce both speakers. I'm not going to read their bios for you in full because you've just had them on your screens and you're aware of them already. But rather, I just wanted to really emphasize how lucky we are to have these two speakers with us today. Jacqueline Huang Nguyen uh, com combines uh, her practice as an artist with her research as a PhD candidate um, and with, with as well her, uh, her own personal autobiographical um, affiliation with the images that she's discussing today. So this kind of interdisciplinary perspective really uh, enriches and informs her work. Similarly, Zoe Butt um, works as a curator and a writer, um, working with contemporary artists in Vietnam and across Southeast Asia and globally across the global South. Um, and she brings together um, a, an approach that emphasizes the uh, pressing concerns of the contemporary today um, with a, you know, a real interest in, in the historical depth that underpins those concerns. And so again, that kind of interdisciplinary approach that really informs and enriches her work as well. So very much looking forward to today's conversation. Without any further ado, I'll hand over to you now, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So um, first of all, I just wanna thank you so much, Roger Nelson, for the wonderful organizing and also the entire team at the Singapore National Gallery. We've been really fabulous to work with um, every one of you. Uh, I'll share my screen here. Let's see. And everybody can see it well, there's no issues. So I just wanna uh, introduce you to the structure of my lecture today. It's a work in progress, so it's a living document. Things will move and shift and um, yeah, it's, um, it's still kind of rough diamond that I'm working with. But um, just to inform you, my lecture is divided into three parts, a preamble, part one and part two. So let's start where it ended. On March 27th, 2015, my grandfather Nguyen Tu took his last breath on his hospital bed in Montreal. With his passing, a lot was lost. The language, the Vietnamese language my grandparents forced me to speak as a kid and Confucian values that were highly upheld in our family. However, a handwritten genealogy book that traces my family history back to the founding of the Nguyen dynasty from 1779 and a rich photo collection were to be passed down. I was given the responsibility to care for a family history. Since childhood, my grandfather showed me the photographs that were salvaged from the French colonial war and the Vietnam War, or known as the American War by the Vietnamese people. After the Republic of Vietnam's defeat against the communists on April 30th, 1975, my grandfather secretly tucked away the family's photographs. Yet my grandparents got rid of traces that might link them to the previous regime. And as told by my grandmother, they burned their clothes in fear of recrimination by the Communist Party of Vietnam, the PCV. On the eve of their departure from Saigon in 1982, as their children had already left by boat people, my grandparents took with them their most cherished and needed belongings in, the, in a modest suitcase, including the photographs to Montreal 
Thanks to a joint effort between the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees Orderly Departure and Canada's Family Reunification Program. Everything else had to be left behind under the strict regulations of the PCV. The images survive, but many of the stories were muted due to the trauma of the wars. Putting order and organizing this collection of photographs was a pastime my grandfather cherished. Composed of approximately 500 small prints, the snapshots and studio portraits, mostly taken in Hue and Saigon from the mid 19 teens to mid 1970s, mainly chronicled the life of my great grandfather, a Mandarin, a Confucian scholar, a civil servant of the third rank for the last emperor of Indochina, Bao Dai. These documents become the only rem remaining traces that we have of the final days of the Nguyen dynasty as they float on the backdrop, backdrop of pivotal historical events. The photographs are accompanied by handwritten notes and while flipping through the pages, one can observe a wide range of events. Photos were taken in the house garden, evening dinners with friends and relatives in home settings, my great grandfather on vacation at the beach with the royal family or at work at the royal palace, the enthronement of the last empress in Saigon, the house of worship of the ancestors dilap dilapidated following the unfamous incursion of the communists in 1968, portraits of the family matriarch matriarchs, family relatives attending funerals or visiting relatives tombstones, festive weddings, my grandfather conducting an internship at a hospital in Saigon, my grandmother on vacation with a friend in Hong Kong, my dad attending the 13th World Scout Jambori in Japan, or my grandmother working at a glue factory after the fall of Saigon. Clearly the camera was an integral part of their daily lives. While my family believed in Confucianism and Buddhism, they were not un unsympathetic to European modernity. My, fa my father and his siblings were all schooled in the French system. My grandfather we practiced Western medicine and my grandmother was even a French teacher for school children. While adopting human humanist ideals, they also could not relegate their Vietnamese culture and history. For me, staring at these photographs offer a distinct sense of agency and an air of self-representation that are absent in colonial archives. I am left to wonder where similar images are to be found. Part one, limits of the colonial archives. A few months after my grandfather had passed away, the Swedish National Museums of World Culture in Stockholm and Gothenburg opened for the first time their archives for an artist in residence. Most of the history of photography in Southeast Asia is predominantly chronicle from the perspective of colonial empires or by foreign born photographers. These images are normally filed away in the colonial archives and are cared for eternity in climate control rooms. Meanwhile, European ethnographers, explorers, or photographers benefit from their relentless celebratory myopism for their scientific, technological, and artistic contributions. Photographs taken during the colonial era for focus on architectural or engineering prowess. The abundant and luscious local nature were to be exploit, exploited visually and physically. Slender Indochinese women, opium intoxicated men or behead, beheaded bandits are a recurrent, recurrent motifs. And, could, and we could see that they were people to be civilized. The visual indexicality falls into what Edward Syed's coins as the binary division between East and West as part of European civilizing project. 10 museums of ethnography and world culture aim to develop a collaborative and inclusive practice that investigate the potential of a shared authority in the museum context. Artists with a diaspora background who could develop historical as well as inventive relations to the archives and its possible and impossible futures were encouraged to, to participate. My initial proposal for the resid residency was timely enough to rely on my family photographs and to put them in dialogue with sim similar images that I could find in the museum's collections. Photographs brought back from ethnographic expeditions filed away in the colonial archives could be of my possible relatives or I envision speculatively that they could be of my relatives. 
Yet photographs once documented by family members or people of the community have not been of interest by these very same museums. When I started the residency, my first mission was to locate the photograph with the assigned accession number 13963 that I found in the museum's online database. Acquired by the museum in 1956, the photographer is unknown, but it came to the museum thanks to the former director Karl Gustav Isikovitz. The figure in the photograph was described as woman wearing a dress with a dragon. After a month long research in the museum's basement archive, I finally found 013963. Her portrait features amongst a pile of snapshots documenting street life in a bustling Vietnamese town alongside another series of indigenous women from the high line, uh, indigenous peoples from the highlands of Vietnam. Her image contrasted with the other ones. Although former explorer Carl Gustav Isikovitz is the one to be remembered at the museum, I know the name of the sitter. She is Her Majesty Nam Phuom, the first and primary wife of Bao Dai, the last, uh, or the last empress of Indochina. Her Majesty Nam Phuom hand signed dated and offered a copy of her portrait to my great grandfather to thank him for his services over the years. She's seen here with her first son, Bao Long, sitting on her knees. While it felt satisfactory to finally find the portrait of Her Majesty Nam Phuong, it left me with more questions than answers. The gap between the biographical documents and the museum's collected material used for scientific endeavor created an unease in me and problematized the museum's universality. For me, it begged the question, who the institution ought to serve? In reaction to the limits of the colonial archives and acknowledging the fragility of family histories that once were torn apart from wars and forced into displacements, I produced the work titled Presence in Absentia in 2019. Presented on low pedestals, these sand images taken from the very same photo family photo collection I inherited are reproduced here in bright colors. The recreated images and sand function as mandalas. They symbolize the universe and are created to be destroyed. The work is an exploration of love, kinship, and power in the face of colonial violence, history, and the unyielding force of time. My examination of the fragility of these portraits and of their source materials reveal the fate of families that are shattered, names that are unpronounceable, histories that are unwritten. Hearts are lost, some stories are silenced. Their world is in continuous, are continuously to be recomposed and reconstituted, particularly for those who have lost everything. The earliest photographs that we carry are from my great grandfather as a schoolboy, school boy, taken approximately from the 19 teens. The organized snapshots with handwritten comments made me realize that my, my family had adopted and even welcomed the photographic technology in our home. The camera was amongst us, but who took the pictures? Certainly not a Westerner. It begs the question whether Vietnamese ever produced their own photographs. In this presentation, I will present part of my PhD research at the inter intersection of my research-based practice and the study of global presence of Vietnamese photographers already from the late 19th, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. As we will see, photography by the indigène, as called at the time, played an unambiguous role in shaping Vietnamese modernity and its colonial struggle. According to historian Sebastian Conrad, global history's core concern are intertwined with questions of mobility and exchange that transcend borders and boundaries. And he stresses that it takes the in interconnected world as its starting point and the circulation and exchange of things, people, ideas, and institutions as co-constitutive. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. This is absolutely fascinating. Um, Zoe, over to you. Thank you, Jacqueline. As usual, I've learned a lot, but I'm really 
really a few things of just basic response uh, as a consequence of what you just shared, but also our conversations. I really love the fact that you say upon receipt of inheriting this collection of photographs, you were struck by how comfortable your family was in front of the camera. And, and why was that? And at that time, such technology would have been quite unfamiliar, foreign. And to ask yourself, was someone in my family a photographer or was this a Vietnamese photographer? I really love how you as an artist found yourself asking these questions and it then triggered a phenomenal body of research, which as you just said, is a continuing uh, journey. It says a lot about how photos or art rather can engage a nation's desire for change, in this case for independence, and that one should never underestimate the trigger of an image. I'm also struck by the spurring of your intentions motivated by a family archive and what it means to inherit not only the images, but I do recall you saying that the family also took the machines with them too, and that much of your childhood was being surrounded by these varying little cameras and their lenses. And I'm also really, really compelled by how you talk about the dark room as a site of solidarity and indeed of labor and the space of this as artistic production, indeed kind of like a vehicle through which social ideas are discussed and still today, I think, given agency. So in light of this talk today, being associated with this exhibition that's soon to be held at the National Gallery of Singapore called Living Pictures. And indeed, I note that the mission of the show is to share not so much about what photographs do, but what they shape. And I'm wishing I could see this show for, I do agree, images today more than any other era shape our memories. Indeed, I feel like our memories are so disembodied in our recall today, the fabric of the social world it often attempts to record is disastrously myopic. It is in this that I really like how you say that these photographs for you, the hunt for explaining the gaps of time with the various historical figures you are trying to map in their journeys, that these images are important to you in that they prompt an imagination of who else was in the room. The image itself, as you say, is not of ultimate focus per se, it's the existence of the photograph's materiality and what, what such materiality gave agency towards. And in this case, an anti-colonial movement against French occupation of Vietnam. So how do images, the creation of images of photographs, how do they organize, socialize? And what is their relation? The person who took the photo, the person who used the photo, the person who has archived the photo, what is their relation to the representation an artist like you will then put together of them all? And here I can't help but think of the descendants of such historical figures you're researching and their own care or not of such history. So I know that much of your research has gone via meeting the various descendants of these figures. And it's also one worth noting that particularly much of this action was operating under sensitive, politically fragile contexts, for one can only begin to imagine what it must have been like to be Kanki in Paris at a time when the surveillance of Vietnamese dissidents was on the rise. I'm drawn to bring you my own experience into this equation as a curator who has been living in Vietnam for the last 15 years, a country with some incredible contemporary artists, but sadly still facing political scrutiny of their work to a degree that is stultifying and numbing at the same time. Stultifying for there is so much red tape surrounding the desire to be critical with one's understanding of reality and numbing for the apathy that sets in as a consequence of just so much red tape that the self-censoring becomes a subconscious default. I'm just going to share my screen. So 
So back in 2011, when I was the executive director of San Art in Ho Chi Minh City, a very critical artist from space, we held a solo show for local artist Feng Guang. It was called Space Limit, a series of 11 photographs, two sculptures and a site-specific installation. These images variously illustrated various human habit beneath the ubiquitous bamboo cage that most of those living across Asia would be familiar with typically housing squawking roosters. On opening night, we received word from the Ministry of Culture that only one of the 11 photographs submitted for license were approved to be displayed. What struck me with this decision was the censorship of the representation of the cage, but the actual experience of entering a cage was not. For indeed our audience were having to enter the cage in order to see the censored show. The site specific installation was an architectural one whereby the entire building of San Art was placed under this bamboo cage, including its courtyard entrance. In Vietnam, the visual arts is still considered an ideological arm of the state and the Ministry of Culture, a descendant of the country's propagandist department. Film and photography are one of the most heavily monitored mediums in the cultural sphere. The authority of the image retains great power that is considered a potential threat to the status quo and thus in many respects, the artistic image is thus denied of its intentionality due to the constant doctoring it undergoes in order to be published. And thus, Jacqueline, your exploration of the motivation for photography, investigating its social spaces of production, attempting to understand the limits of its visibility is a very pertinent one, even to this day. It reminds me of another project that I had the pleasure of working on with Vietnamese artist Hung Ngo. In 2020, the Factory Contemporary Art Center in Saigon staged her solo show called Lost in View. Much of Hung Nol's art focuses on the nature of the print medium, its image, its topography, and its circulation. The exhibition focused on the presence of women in the revolutionary zeal of Vietnam's 1930s and 40s, initially inspired by the life of one of Vietnam's most celebrated and one of the only officially recognized women of the Vietnam's Communist Party. Her name is Winthy Minh Khai, indeed perhaps a peer of Kang Ki, who is critical to Jacqueline's PhD. For this show, there were a great number of works that played with concepts of the invisible via the presence of code, a coded language of image, text, and sound. Archival letters between Winthy Minh Khai and her communist brothers were presented in invisible ink as you can see on the left. A video gave hint to what it might have been like communicating as party members in Saigon in the 1940s through specific sounds used as alerts in the urban environment, whilst a series of ID cards belonging to Winthi Minh Kai demonstrate how much clandestine paperwork existed in support of this revolutionary moment. The lack of direct representation in this exhibition of this significant figure was baffling to my local audiences, but the conversations it generated with differing university classes that took place within the gallery space were unique in their ability to give visual to not only the lengths a revolutionary movement would go to remain undetected, it also revealed the critical role women, and not only Winthi Minh Kai, had at that time. Indeed, one could say that the rise of a feminist thinking arose at this crucial moment. I'm recalling this project in relation to your own, Jacqueline, for the research of archival documents of which many were photographs and handwritten letters akin to your own experiences were similar to Hong Nong, who also was prompting an assessment of a social world not only uh, previously recorded and also cent no centralized archive in existence. I appreciate how you share how difficult it has been to gain access to material in an absence of any organized centralized archive, that you have had to rely on the personal networks of the descendants of the men you are tracing for information, and that much imagery collated by foreign powers was in the service of surveillance, and thus there is much nondescript image to wade through 
And I can't help but be prompted yet again to reiterate how archives today, especially in my part of the world, can never be considered a place to map history. For surveillance doctors, it omits. Artists thus in their archiving hold very important roles in collating cultural memory. And in Vietnam, who collects information is as sensitive as who authors it and displays it. For example, in 2017, the factory held a solo show for a young photographer artist, Dat Vu, whose stunning photographs record of Vietnam and its social habits that often look staged, but it is indeed his ability to capture particular moments that freeze contradiction beautifully. For his show of over 60 images, there were quite a few we could not submit for license. For opening night, that pleaded with me for just one unlicensed image to sneak on the wall, which is the bottom right image on this slide. It was an image of a Vietnamese rural landscape where a fire burning rubbish sat in front of a wall painted with a communist poster. From a particular angle, the photograph appears to suggest the fire is burning the message of the state. I anxiously acquiesced, stating however it would have to be taken down the next day. After the opening, the factory the next day was visited by not only the Ministry of Culture, but the Cultural Police and the Department of Security. And the factory was placed under interrogation and I was struck that the artist was not called in for questioning as was the previous norm. That day we learnt the laws had changed and the host is now responsible for content. This is a very clever tactic for it not only inhibits artistic intent as a system of censorship, but it also inhibits an ecology for artistic support. I can't help but feel that the early movement of photography under Kanki was similarly navigating the shifting regulations of state surveillance. And it strikes me that still to this day, the lack of an archive of contemporary art practice persists. So Jacqueline, I think what would be great if I can just ask you a question before we go to the, the room, and I hope there's lots of questions in the, in the room with us. In knowing that you have inherited your family's historical collection of photography that documents your family's history, and that you are deeply aware of how precious it is to particular revolutionary memories of Vietnam, do you have any intention to make this collection public in some way? And the second question is, this is a phenomenal body of research that I know is ongoing, but how does it become an artwork? Thank you, Zoe, so much for your response and um, contextualizing my research in today's Vietnam and see and hopefully be able to pull some threads um, and relations um, in how previous practices resonate or not in, in today's photographic practices uh, that we can observe. Um, so two questions, what to do with this collection, um, this archive? I grew up with um, these photographs, seeing my grandfather putting them together and writing notes and all the notes are written in a way that it addresses to me. So this is Jackie's great grand aunt and, and so ever. So it, it feels very personal in the sense that the uh, addressee is very clear. I'm the bearer of this history. And also my grandfather, while growing up also constantly said, you're carrying a history that is very important. This is a history that you need to remember, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dual and a difficult uh, responsibility to have. Uh, on the one hand, um, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, many traces had to be burned um, after the fall of Saigon fearing uh, what the Communist Party could do. And I think for my grandparents, now they've um, passed away, unfortunately. Um, I think they feared much of, much of their lives, the repercussion of um, being allied um, or having allegiance with the wrong party. So it's very yet unclear for me as to how this collection will exist in the future and where it could reside um, I think it's a journey that I'll have to investigate um, and, and see uh, where it could be a proper uh, yeah, frame or host for this, these histories. And your second question as to what kind of artwork, because yeah, I'm not a historian. Um, 
um, I like writing, but it's also a struggle. Um, so I'm not a scholar, so I'm an artist. And so the plan is while doing this research is also writing a script for a film. So I wish to be able to translate some of these questions into film form. And um, now that I'm in Paris, I want to use this opportunity to be able to work with certain um, informants or people that I've interviewed while they're here and also make use of Paris as a backdrop for a scene. So I'm planning to shoot in May uh, a scene here with uh, the great granddaughter, no, the granddaughter of Khan Ki. And so she will act as this mermaid figure who is speaking with um, Khan Ki or hoping to be able to speak directly to her grandfather that she herself doesn't know much and is also in the same journey as me. So we're sharing this collecting <laughs> moment and making sense and trying to sh give a shape to who her grandfather was uh, concurrently uh, together. So it's a nice collaborative process at the moment. And she's very enthusiastic to the idea of actually participating as um, a figure in the film. So we're writing the script partly together so that we can help or I can help her or assist her in voicing or giving voice and speaking directly to her grandfather, fictionally speaking, of course, symbolically. Yeah. Fabulous. I mean, I've got so many more questions to ask you, but I'll leave it there and hand over to Roger. Thank you both so much. Yeah, I have lots of questions as well. Um, before I jump in with mine or, or Zoe with hers, we actually have a question from the audience. Um, others uh, who are listening in, please do feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box anytime. So the question we have here is, thanks Jacqueline, your paper draws mainly from the biographical research around Khan Ki. I was wondering, did the photographs themselves reflect his political ideology, for example, aesthetically, or in Zoe's terms, what was the limit of visuality here? Now, while you're thinking about your response to that, I might just give it a little bit of context. Um, this lecture follows uh, a talk earlier today by Dr. Kevin Chua, which talked about photographs by the um, French archeologist Henri Parmentier. And essentially Kevin's argument was that Parmentier um, despite occasionally falling into these kind of colonial orientalizing tropes, actually was doing something quite different from what most of his um, colonial kind of counterparts were doing. And earlier in the week, we had a lecture from Dr. Alex Subartono, who I should have mentioned at the beginning is uh, the co-convener of this lecture series with National Gallery Singapore. And what Alex was arguing was essentially that um, indigenous photographers like uh, Cassie and Sefas in, in, in Java in Indonesia uh, had what he calls a native vision. In other words, the way that they looked at the world, the way that they represented the world in their photography was demonstrably different from that of their European counterparts. So this lecture series, I suppose, is, has, has been dealing so far quite a bit with the ways in which uh, photographers, um, identity, biography, positionality, um, perhaps is reflected um, in different ways in the aesthetics of, of their photographs. So I think that's sort of the context for this question here. Um, did, you have, did you need me to re read it again or you're okay? I think I'm okay. Um, it's it's hard to fully formulate a, a proper answer since um, the images are missing to have a, a full understanding as to how, uh, what kind of visual language the photographers, Indo-Chinese photographers were using. But from what I understand from the literature, uh, Khan Ki was introduced to the technology from a Chinese um, and probably desire to be able to be engaged in revolutionary ideas. I'm not certain though, that those ideas translated into the image, in the visuality, in the same way that other scholars, for example, managed to manipulate language from Kukmul, uh, from Hanom Chinese characters to Kukmul. I think photography remained quite close, I think, to what French colonial photography looked like. And this is in part because I think Khan Ki got a taste of luxury that he could witness in Paris at the core and the center of the metropole. And I think he could see what he could access through mastering the technology. So I think he understood that he, if he could pr produce beautiful images that could attract a lot of customers and also be able to frame the product as something luxurious, uh, because I've read also that he was considered as more pricey than other studios, that he promised 
something that was better than and more beautiful than the other studios in Vietnam. I think that's where I think he kind of lost himself in the revolutionary project, that he's this kind of complicated figure for Vietnam because he partly participated in the overthrow of the French or had very strong anti-French sentiments. But I think along during his lifetime, um, yeah, I think he more and more embraced the bourgeois living and had to use photography or the skills that he had to ensure to sustain a certain lifestyle. But then again, I need to find and have a larger body of uh, images to be able to fully articulate, um, yeah, a more, I think, accurate answer. Thanks, Jacqueline. Uh, another question from the audience is, uh, did Nguyen Ai Kwok use photographic images as a means to transmit coded messages for his political ideology? Again, we're falling back in the realm of visuality, which um, I, I don't have and I'm unable to fully answer the question. Nguyen Ai Kwok is a big question mark. As we've seen, um, he, he was producing work um, what happened to these beautiful artworks that he promised the 30 by 40 prints that um, Le Paria would send out if uh, readers would send in memberships? I have no idea where these images are. And I think one of the challenges of the time um, and of 100 years in between is that many of these documents were unsigned, were not signed, uh, were perhaps not considered as artworks. And so um, I'm still in the midst, midst of searching. So I would love to see coded language and coded uh, messages in these images. But again, um, I'm, I'm still in the dark here, in the dark room. Thanks, Jacqueline. I have a question myself, um, actually for both of you. Um, Zoe's asked, you know, how do you make art? And my question is why to make art? Um, I think, you know, you're one of a number of contemporary artists, um, a large number of contemporary artists who, whose work engages in, in, in different ways with photographic archives. And there are different motivations for this. Um, Dean Culet, who's an artist who will be um, appearing in, in the Living Pictures exhibition, has talked about some of his works made with found photographs um, as being made with an intention of preserving these photographs. By, by transforming them into an artwork, he ensures that they will be taken care of and thus be available for future generations as a kind of a record of a, of a moment in time. So that's one approach. So my question for, for both of you is, um, what are what are in Jacqueline? What's in your case? What's your motivations for making this, turning this very very personal family history into art? And Zoe, what are some other sort of uh, uh, strategies or intentions behind this kind of practice that you've seen um, through your curatorial work? Maybe Jacqueline, you can go first if you like. Yeah, um, I I feel that the, the practice that I have that is research based and relying on archives is for me an exercise in reinterpretation is to look at documents that once existed that maybe support a main um, state narrative or nationalist narrative and be able to actually create narratives in which I feel I belong to. Um, growing up in French speaking Canada, um, it was a very particular type of discourse that I grew up within which I couldn't um, associate myself with. Um, also, uh, which is a minority linguistically speaking within Canada, and then also on top of that, being daughter of immigrants, refugees. Um, I think it's all ways of, of trying to poke the archives and make sense of how we existed in, in the in-betweenness of the archives between documents and, and open up that crack and make sure that those gaps are filled up with, um, yeah, a space for bodies such as mine and others, actually. So yeah, it's a a task of shedding new light. Yeah, I, I have to say, Jacqueline, as you were describing what you're hoping to do with the descendant of Kanki, I can't help but recall the work of Tuan and Ruwen, the um, ancestors becoming peace, which was part of the Shasha Biennial in 2019. Though the images that he collected were not physical, it was, um, well, of course he had to find the physical, but then what became imperative was the ability to turn them into digital and to put it into a narrative that was owned by 
the people who are depicted in these images. You have the fortune of working with someone who has a direct relationship to the imagery that you're inherited. But in Bond's case, he was dealing with communities. This is specifically the relationship between Vietnam and Senegal, where the um, Trinigar, the soldiers that you were mentioning, were from Vietnam, and they were during the French occupation era uh, of Vietnam. They were in Senegal, they were in Algiers, they were fighting for the French and alongside uh, a varying number of different African soldiers. But in short, there were a lot of families, French, um, African French um, soldiers who were in Vietnam and they married Vietnamese women and they went back to Dakar. But my point here is that the piece, I wish it was possible to share, um, these images are spoken through an imagination of what their descendants might have gone through. So these images often are used increasingly by artists as a way of fictionalizing a history that is otherwise absent. And I find a real marked rise right now of artists who use the photographic image in a trope of what is not labeled as truth, but in actuality, it stands in for it in terms of it representing a community's collective experiences that are not documented in any other form, or it's a highly personal one. Um, one only has to think of um, Pao Fan's practice, which also animates these historical photographs. Um, and, you know, across Southeast Asia, you'll also find artists who build photographic archives for themselves in an attempt to say this particular history matters, such as um, Ahmad Fort Osman in his exploration of Enrique, Milac, um, Enrique, who was said to be the slave of Ferdinand Magellan. So, I mean, it's really wonderful to hear how art places presence for what is perceived as the archival gap. And what I hope is that we see the disciplinary memories of quote unquote history with a capital H, referring to artworks in the future as substantial primary documents of human experience. I hope. Let's see. Well, if I can just respond quickly, Zoe, to your, your provoking um, suggestion or argument. I, I think most likely, I, I, I want to believe that it will be possible because if we think that the history and the role and the status of photography 100 years ago, it wasn't seen as firsthand document that a researcher could rely on. Photography has changed quite drastically in terms of its role and status in academia, uh, quite sig significantly the past decade or so in terms of using it as firsthand, um, yeah, archival source material. So Let's be hopeful <laughs> that it might be possible. I hope so. It's a nice dream. Um, we do have time for another question from the audience. So if anyone has anything they'd like to ask either Jacqueline or Zoe, please do type it into the Q&A box. But I have a question for you about collaboration. Um, you've mentioned about your, um, your work with the descendant of Kanki, but I imagine that there are probably other collaborators that uh, you work with on your research, be it people who are helping you with the, the retrieving of archival documents and so on. And I think um, thinking about the nature of artistic research as collaborative, but also the nature of photographic practice as collaborative is something that uh, we can do more of, I think. We tend to sort of heroize the, the idea of the singular authorial figure. So I wonder if you could talk a bit more about the ways in which your process has um, kind of led you to work with, uh, work with others. Yeah, I mean, um, particularly for this project, it's became even more apparent that I needed to establish a um, proper infrastructure to do the research in the face of COVID and being uh, unable to travel and access archives. So I have a number of researchers that hopefully I can trust are <laughs> working with different archives, some in Germany, one in Germany, one in China, one in Vietnam and one here in France. Um, so it's it's been a conversation that I've been entertaining for the past year or so. Um, and now I'm slowly building up a team for the production. And what I'm quite excited about is um, the extras and the, the people who will be in front of the camera that I'm now slowly casting and also uh, preparing costumes for. Um, all the dialogues that I have with um, also 
the people who will be in front and behind the camera is informing um, the research and the script writing. And, and so I'm open to kind of have these spaces at, as quite porous in terms of being able to take the imprint of the present um, because none of this, particularly not the artwork or the film aim to be historically accurate. Um, I don't, I'm not trying to be like a, how you call it, like an epoch film, like that is proper of the 1930s. I'm unable to reproduce that partly because of financial economical limits, but also to be able to see that I'm talking from the present. I'm talking from today with today's perspectives and what is available to me from which I can use and, and speak from. And so the voices of the actors and some of the extras uh, will feed in into the writing of the script, but definitely people who are behind the scenes and working on the historical documents are also giving me inputs. Uh, for a long time, uh, for example, uh, with one of my researchers, we were playing with the idea that maybe Han Ki was a spy and was informing the French authorities because I could see traces of French authorities saying, we need to surveil him, but I was unable to find the actual documents of where the civilian documents uh, ended up. And it was with after long, a long search in different places that I was able to get hold of an archivist who told me, oh, we have the box which holds all the documents, the civilian documents. And that's when this idea and this fiction of Hanki as being a spy um, actually burst, that he was actually, yeah, being surveilled and not collaborating, basically. Thank you. I think uh, this is a good, a good point to remember as well, that even with a, a study that's kind of uh, nationally bound in the sense that you're, you're dealing with photographers from, from Vietnam, uh, nevertheless, the nature of your research is, is necessarily transnational in scope. And I think that's another kind of important point to remember. Um, we've had a number of people asking us about recordings of, of this session and of the other um, lectures in, in this series. And so I just wanted to say that um, uh, edited versions of these talks will be available online. Um, and the lecture series will continue um, after November when the exhibition opens at National Gallery Singapore. So do keep an eye out on our um, social media and so on for um, the edited recordings um, of uh, today's lecture and the other lectures in this series, which as I said, I should have mentioned at the beginning, is co-convened by the gallery um, with Dr. Alex Subaratono. Jacqueline and Zoe, you've both been absolutely wonderful. Um, I think that's all we have time for today, but thank you both so much for such inspiring uh, presentations and so much food for thought as well. Um, so either of you have any last things you'd like to say? Keep me posted on the final artwork. Yeah, looking forward <laughs> to the film and the PhD thesis. <laughs> Great. In a few years. Good things take time. All right, thank you both <laughs> once again. Um, and thank you to everyone who worked behind the scenes on today's lecture. Um, and thank you all for being here. Have thank a good you. day. <laughs>